was driving to uh, farmland, and I've heard of uh, Mr. Tony's work before, and I really didn't know where he really lived, but I was driving by farmland, and I saw home of Ansel Tony, and that's when I almost hit a tree. Uh, this is, that's where he lives. So I tried to find his residence, and I called him from a restaurant there, and uh, we, he said, come on over and we can speak some more. So I came over and we talked and we talked and we talked. And I wish I could really relate to you the spark of energy, the spark of enjoyment and life that I got from that conversation. And I think tonight you will experience that yourself. I think uh, in, in our school of environmental design, we are always kind of seeking uh, beauty. And I think tonight we will somewhat share the beauty of a man that really enjoys what he does. And I think it's an ample kind of experience to get. And I really, really feel uh, honored to have this opportunity to present to you uh, this gentleman. At this moment, I would just like him to be recognized and felt welcome. I'm actually just representing you here and making him feel welcome. So please give a warm welcome to Mr. Ansel Tony. Boy, this is so exciting. <laughs> uh, first, I think we uh, will have several things happening tonight. I think uh, what I will do right now uh, is uh, turn the mic to Professor John Russell, and then I will be coming forth to, to take certain questions and so forth later. Thank you, Michelle. Well, this is indeed a very happy occasion to really find a kind of town and gown experience tonight where people who have come from, I believe, as far away as Ohio, who are relatives of Ansel Tony, and we're just delighted to have you here. I haven't had the opportunity to meet you. Uh, I don't know where you are out there, but welcome from us here at Ball State, and thank you for being here. We're really delighted also to have family members uh, from Mr. Tony and uh, certainly a variety of other friends and uh, kite enthusiasts. And these are a very interesting breed of people I've learned uh, over the last uh, few weeks. We asked Mr. Tony to please provide us with some names and directions of people who are former students of his and I use that uh, in a very broad uh, term. Uh, others who have been uh, associated with him in this marvelous uh, endeavor of kite making and kite design. And uh, that has led to some marvelous, marvelous people out there that we here in our perhaps isolated bastion of Ball State University uh, have missed the opportunity of this connection and we're just delighted to have made that through this experience. Is uh, your son Bill here tonight? Uh, yes, there. Welcome, please, and, and family, and uh, grandson here in front. Doug, Tony, uh, you're in the audience back there. You got crowded out, I'm sorry. But we'll catch up with you here in a moment. Uh, did Mr. Carl Bonta come in? Uh, he thought he might be able to. Mr. Bonta has provided uh, a marvelous array of kites here. Many of them we do not have up. Uh, some are here. Uh, we were just overflowing with the wonderful contribution of flights of kites. Mr. Merritt Beck is one of our contributors here to this exhibit, and we thank you very much, uh, Mr. Beck. 
And your wife, uh, Ethel, is in the back here somewhere. Yes. Mrs. Shirley Coates is another exhibitor and a host of uh, friends and family there. Welcome. Mrs. Jane Langdon and uh, your husband, Jane. Oh, there we are. OK. Mrs. Langdon and her son, Rich, who we're sorry is not able to join us, are in the manufacture and uh, design and, and manufacture of kites and uh, have a very, uh, very fine uh, product there. Mrs. Uh, Vicki Morris is a contributor. Vicki? Is Vicki here? Where? Way in the back. OK, welcome. Sorry we didn't find room up here. Uh, Mr. Phil Osgood and friends and family, thank you. Uh, and Mr. David DeBolt, and welcome. Uh, you have the world's smallest kite with you this evening. Uh, we'll have a demonstration afterwards. It's incredible. And it's through these people and m many others that we've heard about that uh, we have this wonderful array of exhibits which were put up by Uva Cooler and two students here in the college, and we certainly thank them for their efforts in, in getting this exhibit up. We're also deeply grateful to Mr. DeBolt for leading us to the panels on the Colorful Kites Tales, which is an exhibit up on the second floor out by the concession lounge area. And they were provided by Angel's Mound, Angel Mound State Park in Evansville. And it is a Smithsonian Institute exhibit which they purchased and used for a kite exhibit. And they so generously made that available to us. So if you'd please welcome the exhibitors and recognize their contribution with a hearty applause. We certainly thank them. We have a presentation this evening on videotape uh, through the wizardry of modern technology, which seems to be taking over about two thirds of the hall. But uh, one of these days, I suspect, one of these brilliant little guys in a white smock will reduce that to about the size of a pinhead, as it's happening with everything else. But uh, this is a marvelous uh, projector. It's the first time we've used it here in the college, I believe. Isn't that correct, Bob? And uh, we are going to present a, mainly the Channel 49 presentation on the life of Ansel Tony. And we certainly thank them for contributing the tape. And we have a small uh, uh, section that we've wedged in there from Channel 8 in Indianapolis. So it's a little bit of an amalgamation. We think you'll enjoy it. And if we can have the lights out, please, and uh, Flip the switch. Thank you. Told me I'd run a sewing machine. Uh, I kind of told them that they didn't know what they were talking about. The way I got involved, <clears throat> my wife went over to Mr. Tony's and bought kites for our children and uh, grandchildren for Christmas. That's been four or five years ago. And she said, if you, when she came home, she said, if you don't get over there and help him, why, we'll never get those for Christmas. So I went over, and uh, I walked into his house, and inside the kitchen door was a refrigerator. And all over that refrigerator were orders. I mean, it was just covered, all the exposed sides. I went in his front room, and the woodwork on the door facings, all of them lined with orders all over the place. <laughs> And so I could see what my wife meant, that if we didn't get over there and help him. So I started making reels for him. I'd work in the shop in the daytime, and uh, he would sew all day. And I'd drive over and go in of a morning and pick up his kites that he'd sewn the day before, and I'd take them out to the shop and put sticks in them. <clears throat> And then I'd take them back in because he still had to do some more sewing on them to sew the sticks in. And I'd 
make reels all day, and I'd go over to the village pantry right next to his house and get something to eat, and I'd never see him until evening when I'd take the key to the shop back to him. So I did that for about two and a half years, and uh, that's quite, a, quite an experience to be with Mr. Tony for two and a half years. I don't know how many people came in during that time asking him about different things that they wanted to know about. Bees, for example, gardening, I don't know what all. And he always had an answer for them. And it seemed to work. He's a very knowledgeable person. And he is a person who is a doer. And there's not too many of those people around anymore like he is. He does things. And it was a pleasure to work with him and the reason I quit, I guess he fired me maybe, I don't know, but he said he was going to quit making kites. So I thought, well, he's taught me how, so I'll, I'll go back and I'll start making them. He was going to garden. And he's a, quite a farmer and a gardener, and he was growing these huge pumpkins, four, five, six hundred pounds. But that summer they had a drought and his garden didn't produce, so he went back to making kites. But I stop in and see Mr. Tony every Monday evening and any other time that I go through. And it was a joy to work with him and be with him and learn how to do the kites. There isn't too much money in the thing. The thing that uh, he did, he taught a lot of people, even while I was there. People would come in and want to know how to make kites. And he would teach them, and especially women. And the thing that uh, they didn't realize was that the sewing of the kite is one of the first things that you do, but the sticks and the reels are something else. And if you don't have the facilities to take care of that, you're in trouble. So uh, some of them learned how to sew kites, but then it was another thing to learn how to get somebody to put the sticks in and uh, make the reels. It was a pleasure and it's been very nice of you inviting me over. Thank you, Mr. Beck. Um, Mrs. Coates. I usually tell people that I'm a bigger fan of Ansel Tony than he is of himself because he sends them on down the highway to my house when he has an overflow. And I'll say, have you seen this later article about Ansel? No, he didn't mention that. Well, I have scrapbooks and I have pictures that he never mentions to people because I have known Ansel for quite a while. I used to pick apples out of his orchard, but he cut down the orchard and put in the village pantry. <laughs> uh, like Merritt said, he has taught many people. We have stayed in it, I think, for about six years. My first one was a gift from my sister. And like many people, I stood it behind the door for several months. But when I first took it out and learned to fly it, I was hooked. And I wanted to pass on some as gifts. And when I went to Ansel, he still had all of those orders. And he said, if you'll come down, I'll show you how to make them. So my daughter-in-law and I went down my daughter-in-law does a wonderful job on the appliques. It seems like that all of us that make kites have our own specialty. And hers is the appliques, mine the basic. Uh, her applique is up here, the cardinal, the unicorn. Um, I've made a few reels, I've helped make a few reels. But I, I hope I don't have to make any more. <laughs> My husband and son have a construction company, and so they're nice enough to take over the woodwork. And so that is the secret for us staying in the business. The family working together, the men doing the woodwork, and the women doing the sewing. I do, um, we've taken them to Florida. I have worked a few shows. About two years ago, I started keeping We have them. I'll touch this, did I? We have them in 40 states and six foreign countries that I know of. 
uh, there isn't a lot of money in it because the cost of material just keeps going up and going up and going up. And until a person has flown one, they think that's an awful lot of money for a kite. But the real thrill is to see the people flying their kite and enjoying it. And I have an awful lot of men, especially men, buying them for their grandchildren that are two and three years old. <laughs> and I don't really believe the grandson flies it. But I do thank Ansel for introducing me to a whole new hobby, went on to a business, and we're still really loving it. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Here comes Doug. <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, Merritt and Mrs. Coates thank Grandpa for uh, teaching them how to make kites. I want to thank him for marrying Stella Dunlap and uh, making me possible. Uh, one thing I got to do right away, though, I, in all this exposure that he's received over the years, somehow I've got caught up in, into quite a bit, as you saw with that. And when Ted Turner's film crew came in to do Portrait of Indiana, they stopped at our house and spent a couple of days, uh, I guess because we represented as, you might have seen the little daughter running around there, Ansel's great-granddaughter. Uh, we represented maybe a new uh, generation. But the one person who keeps telling me, why don't they talk to me is my father, and I want you to know where he is, and would you please stand up? <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's also partially responsible for me being here. <laughs> um, I want to tell you a couple things about grandfather. Of course, uh, obviously, I've known him a long time. Uh, some of the things that uh, come to mind is, uh, well, relatively recent story was I was stopping in Farmley, and I moved back to the community about six years ago, and I had stopped uptown, and his neighbor came up to me and sort of was, you know, back and forth on the, feet and I could tell that there was something they wanted to ask and they felt a little uncomfortable and they said, you know those three young girls from Wisconsin that are making kites? They said, where are they staying at night? <laughs> and I said, well, wh why are you asking? And they said, well, when we went to bed at 11, their vehicle was there. When we got up at 6, it was still was there and we thought that was an awful long ways to drive to Muncie to go to the motel. And Well, I was just, I said, they stayed there. Yeah, that's, that's okay, but just realize that all three of their ages added together don't equal his. <laughs> well, I, you know, after we talked about it, I could see that he was just mainly admiring my grandfather for having that sort of attractive nature at his age. <laughs> Another thing, you know, that's a, that's a contemporary story, and he's kind of fun to tease. I can remember when he wasn't quite so fun to tease, when he was a little bit more businesslike, and we had to farm to try and make a living on. But I can remember uh, as a younger child on several occasions where something would happen as obscure as a flat bicycle tire or a misconnection on a ride home that someone would come up to me that I would barely know and said, you're one of the Tonys. You know, that's a funny thing about a small community. They recognize all of you, you know, so that's a, both a blessing and a curse. But uh, they said, you know, during the Depression, when my parents couldn't put food on the table. There was always work to be done at the Tony farm and they would feed us. And so you hear these stories about how, about how he would tell grandmother that uh, there were six more people to feed. So he had a good heart from the very beginning. And this kite thing has just sort of made him spread out. I think there's a lot of people from farmland here I've seen that have known uh, Ansel for years and years and years, and they all kind of get a chuckle when they see the camera crews coming in. And, and, and uh, I just want to tell you that uh, the man uh, has marveled me. He, he makes it pretty hard to set some goals uh, that are comfortable to reach. Uh, I, we were, I still help on the family farm, at, and uh, 
there was a disagreement, as, especially as you know with families, how that goes. And I was thinking that possibly we, I had reached the point where I knew, at least on this one particular aspect of farming, as much, as much as my father. So he left to go to grandfather's farm, and I uh, mentioned to my wife that, I don't know, you know, at 34 years of age, you'd think that maybe my father shouldn't be telling me so much to do. And she went into town to get him, and she got there, and there was Ansel telling my father what he thought he needed to be doing with the farm. And so my wife came back and said, don't worry about it, you've only got another 30 years to go. <laughs> Last year, he flew to California to his oldest son's 50th wedding anniversary. Now, I think that's kind of incredible. I, I, I kept trying to put myself in the mind of my uncle who was, you know, introducing him to their friends who were all retired. I mean, we're talking about a man who's been retired for 10 years and says, yes, this is our 50th wedding anniversary and I'd like you to meet my father. <laughs> but uh, just to wrap it up, I'd just like to tell you uh, how fortunate I feel to uh, have a grandfather like Ansel and how nice it is that he's still alive. It's a, last Thanksgiving, we were sitting around, everybody had stuffed themselves in a typical rural family setting, and we were all laying around on the floor. And he said to me, you know, when I was working in a field in Ohio when I was a child and I saw some hot air balloons go over, I, gee, I think it was about 1903 or four. Do you know what that was? And I thought, you know, why in the world would I know that? Well, we started researching, and he came up with some name, and within about 20 minutes, we had found that there had been a hot air balloon race from St. Louis to the East Coast. And he remembered running to a one-room schoolhouse and getting all the kids to come outside to tell, to see it. So his fascination with uh, flying uh, goes back a long while. Thank you very much. Mr. Ansel Tony. Uh, Mr. Tony. I thought perhaps we might uh, just talk about a couple of the kites that you've made, and we have a few samples around us. Perhaps you could describe again just a little bit. Uh, one of these, uh, I think, is called the sled kite. Is that yeah, correct? It's a little uh, parafoil sled kite. That there was um, well, the first one I ever saw saw of them was um, a, a young man come over to uh, Dublin, Ohio on his motorcycle, one of them in his hip pocket, come from British Columbia, come down on his motorcycle, he and a Chinese boy from San Francisco, they rode in and when we went over to Dublin to the, the convention, the big kite convention, there were the two motorcycles sitting out there and I got acquainted with them over there at the convention and they stopped and stayed all night with me on their way back home. Yeah. And he had one of these in his hip pocket. He introduced that to you. Then. And he was a chef on a big tugboat that hauled the um, gravel and pipe lines for the big Alaskan pipeline. Yes. And uh, he was an interesting man because he was the uh, uh, the uh, chef on the boat. And when we got up uh, the next morning for breakfast, I said, you're a chef, you can get breakfast. <laughs> so we got the pancake batter out, made up pancakes, you got out this big gallon can of tree molasses, good old tree molasses, maple syrup, and we had we got sausages for for to eat with, with them, you know. And we had a good breakfast, and he uh, he it would take when he was not busy cooking on the boat, uh, preparing the meals. He'd take us out and fly it over the, the Pacific Ocean. Now this has little pockets in it. Yeah, it? that's the parafoil. Now see this uh, man Jalbert. He's an aeronautic engineer that flew during the uh, uh, flew missions during the uh, Vietnam War, and uh, he's uh, he's made all the he's designed and and made all the uh, put the 
parafoils all on the market. Yes. Uh, this style with the pockets, they fly without any struts or sticks. There's a larger one over there. Yeah, that, next to that's one of his uh, designs. And uh, he made the big parasails, and he made the, um, the uh, big parachute that you could control. It looked like a mattress, you know? Yes. And now the wind goes up and into those pockets. Yeah, they fill out and it blooms out and, and they make a pretty nice kite. And then there's a boy from, um, come up from Hagerstown. Thank you, Mr. Beck. This, this last week. And he's making uh, one of those uh, Jobbert kites. Yes. He's yes. putting 15 keels on it. Oh, my. Yeah, it's, it's going to be big enough to just about lift him off the ground. <laughs> you have to be careful with it. When Jobbert made his first one, he made his first when he was flying it in a park, and it, it was just too much for him, and, and drug him, and he had to put him in the hospital. Oh now these are these you call these, uh, that's a little uh, spinner. spinner. Yes, he designed those, and a, a girl from Australia came in to, to our place there one day from down uh, from over Detroit. She born and raised in Australia. She moved to Detroit, and she brought one of these down for a pattern. And then I commenced making those. And, now and they'll they make three uh, you or four. can use them as a drogue or yeah, just as, as a drogue as or just for to look at, you know, just for to make it. Uh, well, it makes some of the kites more stable. Yes. And then it will. Um, you can put it on the line. It'll go right up to the kite. Yes. Don't make it as how high it is. It'll the farther up it is, the faster it'll go. You were telling us about uh, kite making when you were a boy outside of Richmond, was it? In, it was down to Liberty, Indiana. My yes, dad moved yes. down there for five years. I was four years old when we moved down there, and then we'd come back to the 500-acre farm. You used uh, to do we, some things for excitement with kites. Yes, uh, it, we made What were some of those exciting uh, And adventures. we had little hot air balloons that we made, you know, and I was only nine years old when we made those. And we'd put a, a, dig a pit in the ground, and put a stove pipe on that, a piece of metal laid there, you know, with a hole in it. And we hold our balloons up over that to get the hot air in them. And they'd yes. go up a couple of 300 feet, you know. Mm -hmm. We'd go retrieve them and put them up again. Yes. And that was a lot of fun for kids, you know. <laughs> you said something about dynamite. Yeah, we had a, my dad made a big kite one time. It was about eight, nine feet tall. We had to use clothesline rope, but it didn't have any good twine then, you know, no nylon, just old common old Melilla twine. And some of the twine was made out of hemp, what you call marijuana. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We didn't know it was that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was the plant of the marijuana plant. Yes. The yes. old hemp plant. And <laughs> we'd uh, put the tail on the kite and put on two or three sticks of dynamite with a long fuse on it, let it fall up up there. You hear it clear into Richmond, 11 miles. <laughs> <laughs> we, we put Japanese lanterns on the big kites, and, and they had uh, with candles in them. And they'd have a whole string up, and they'd catch fire, burn up, burn the tail off the kite, and come down. <laughs> and they had kites that wouldn't fly without tails. Now they've got kites that'll fly without tails. You say that you hit a thermal with that kite. Yes, I put one of those up just like that on it. Pure white. And I just happened to have a um, reel with 4,800 feet of line, a 50-pound test. And I went out there on, in October, and the wind was just a nice breeze, you know. I saw an old turkey buzzard coming in from the east. I knew it was about time they was leaving for the south. And he was hunting a thermal, and I never had a kite on a thermal in my life before. And I saw that buzzard commence going around and around like that, going up. I said, uh-oh, there's a thermal. <laughs> I worked my kite over into that thermal. It went straight up, clear in through the clouds and on up. Disappeared. Disappeared behind the clouds. Wonderful. Then I brought it back down. And it, it just, that was the best flight of a kite ever made in my life. I just happened to get in one of those thermals. Now, this kite has an interesting story in that it's a kind of a combination of designs. Is that well, correct? Well, this you take the uh, part from here down. It's called, a, you've got some of them hanging up here someplace. It's called the Silas Konyakite. He flew it at the St. Louis Wells Fair. There it is, right above us. Is that yeah, one? Well, 
That's a Tanya uh, Delta. Where is it? Yeah, the Tanya. Where is it? It's South uh, Tanya. Number eight. Number eight. Oh, yes, yeah, right eight. here in the center here. Yeah, there's one. Now, I was uh, experimenting with uh, the kites, and I thought, well, now, why not just leave the, the uh, corner on, the delta wing, and just spread them out and put the, a few more of those um, little cells in? And it did, and it, they just flew beautiful. I think you can, Mr. Beck will tell you, they, they fly about the best of any kite you've ever put up. They just hang steady, just hang, hang in beautifully. So you've added the delta then to just this to add, uh, design. Added the delta wing on, just left it on. And it has less pull uh, than the one with the, with the wing cut off on the corner. I can't understand that. That don't make sense to me. <laughs> If you cut it off from that stick right down to this right stick, here. right down there, you'd have what you call Silas Conyukite. Yes. When I was over at the Dublin, they had a, um, a string of kites, all, all colors and styles, like you have those uh, cards out there, you know. Yes. And they had the names on them, all the names of the, the makers of the kites, you know. Well, over here they had called the French military. I said, you've got the wrong name on that. And Mr. Jout was standing there and he says, well, how do you know? Well, I said, well, I was at St. Louis World's Fair in 1904 when they flew it. <laughs> Silas, Silas Kanye. So in Y and E. And uh, he says, well, we'll just change that. Well, to see, Silas Kanye developed, the, he patented it in 1902. And then he flew it in 1904 to St. Louis World's Fair. And then the French saw it for the First World War. They made a large one to put a boy up on for military observation, so they call it the French military. That's where it got its name. Yes. Yes. What about some of the other designs that you're into, uh, Mr. Tony? Well, the, the, so many people send me patterns and uh, new designs. And uh, the, uh, there was a girl who came down from South Bend. She caught, well, first place, there was two women come from um, Anderson. Uh, two women from England was with uh, Mrs. Bales, and they came in there and they wanted kites. And so the two English women took kites back to England, and she took a kite. Her son up at South Bend, and he was a, a television operator up there, and uh, he flew his kite. And he won all the prizes, and so there's a young woman there says, uh, "Where did you get that kite?" Well, says I got it down there, at Tony's, and. Uh, he says, well, where's that at? He says, farmland in Indiana. Well, she called me up and know if I'd make kites for her for a kite store. I says, honey, I can't make kites for your kite store, but if you if you can run a sewing machine, you come down and learn to make kites. So she's the one that came down and learned to make the kites, and she went back and she got into it big. The last I heard, she had 33 kite stores in America and 27 foreign countries taking her Incredible. kites. Incredible. And she has an ad in the Kite Line magazine, the Four Winds Kite Store. And she bought a spread over, went from, from uh, over at uh, South Bend, she went to Great Barrington, Massachusetts, bought a great big house with eight bedrooms and, and a barn that she turned into a factory. Yeah. And she's got three big industrial sewing machines running. And she designed the, the snowflake. Mm -hmm. She's mm -hmm. the one that designed the snowflake. She sent me a pattern. And that's I, the multiple uh, yeah, that's cells one here, and there's another right one there. over there's there. there. About the prettiest kite. She made one that was with prisms, and it was more colors in it. And she only made just a few of them. And then there's young. The only fellow from Muncie used to teach here in the school, but Richard Langdon. Yes, yes. Well, he uh, That's his right had there. his mother to make uh, uh, some of those big snowflakes that are nine feet tall. Now, they're beautiful. They're big. I just, I just can't imagine one of them being nine feet tall. Yeah, number nine right here, I believe. Isn't that right, uh, Mrs. Langdon? Was yeah. Mrs. Langdon here? Yes, she's right here. There. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, there she is. <laughs> well, are we ready? Do you want to wait? Oh. In the uh, Kite Line magazine, I saw where there was a fellow 
He asked, uh, what was the smallest kite you ever made? Why, well, he said, it took the wings of an ant and a spider web. <laughs> Mr. DeBolt, do you want to demonstrate the next smallest kite in the world? <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Believe it or not, there's a string attached to this one. Have, have you seen? You saw yeah, that yeah, that's, a, that's unique. That's, that's a beauty. Well, let's see. It says modified three inch by three inch Nagasaki Nata kite. Incredible. Look at that. <laughs> I'd like to correct him just a little bit. This is not the smallest kite in the world. I said it was the next smallest. <clears throat> next, it's still not the <laughs> next to the smallest kite. A gentleman by the name of Charles Sodich, who lives in Chicago, Illinois, is an expert at making miniature kites like this. Uh, he made this one, and I have a slide picture of one that he made at the National Convention, for the National Convention this year. It's just a shade under one inch, just a shade under one inch. It actually flew. It has a tail on it, and it has. Read those dimensions on there. Uh, let's see. These are what three by three? Is that what we've got here? Uh, I need my glasses. Uh, frame. Oh gosh, can anybody read this? Boron filament. It has a boron filament uh, for a for a line on it. And I can't even see it. Uh, the sale is goodness me, sixty. What is that? Millions of a something or other thick mylar film. Uh, it's incredible, Mr. Tony. You can read it here. <laughs> Anyway, fantastic. It's a three by three inch Nagasaki Heidi kite. The frame is a 0 0.004 diameter boron filament. The sail is 0 0.00060 inches. It's a thick uh, mylar film. The flying line is 0.002 inch diameter monofilament. It weighs 0.0005 ounces or is 14 milligrams. The minimum flying speed is not to exceed one half a mile an hour. <laughs> Anytime you want to fly a kite inside, this is a kind to do it with. I'll get it. We'll have some questions and answers here in just a moment, but the candles were lighted, and I wanted to uh, have an early birthday celebration for you, Mr. Tony, who will be 98 on December 12th of this year, and happy 98. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah. All right. Yes. Okay, I think this is uh, time now for uh, we can take any questions uh, from the audience. How does a snowflake kite fly? Well, you have to have a good, strong, steady wind. They fly better in Hawaii or on the coast than they do unless you've got the right, the perfect wind. They'll they'll come down like a rock if the, if the wind just stops. They, they they won't float in like a delta. A delta is one of the best flying kites that's made. I just found out recently who the first man that made it, a delta kite, and that's years and years ago. What year? Hod Taylor. Hod Taylor was the inventor of the delta kite. Huh. Then there's a man in Nantucket that made a delta kite. And that was a little bat kite made out of, of plastic or mylar or something like that, you know. Yes? 
food. What is the secret for your health and longevity? What? Your health and well, longevity. I, mostly, I think I inherited that trait. <laughs> but I had a long, long life family. And well, young girls from Wisconsin, right? My great, my great, great, great grandfather came over from England in 1654. He landed in old Virginia, and he raised a family, a large family of children. And one of his sons came to Ohio after the Revolutionary War. He had six sons in the Revolutionary War. And one of the sons come to Ohio, and that's where I, and he, I went with some of my cousins down to the cemetery where we used to go with the old horse hearse and the uh, coaches. We went back to that cemetery down on the state line between College Corner and Boston, Indiana, and it's southeast of Richmond. And uh, we went back to the cemetery. We had to walk all the way back there. The brush has grown up to them. The cemetery is just its an iron fence around it. And they asked me, they says, Ansel, what do you think about cleaning that up and make a driveway back to it? I says, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. If I was buried there in that Tony Labrick Cemetery, I'd want it just the way it is, vines all over the monuments and no Body has damaged it or shot shotgun shells or shot into it with shotguns or rifles and they haven't destroyed it like they did down in Brown County when we went down there grouse hunting. We saw a cemetery where they just shot the monuments all at that piece. <laughs> <laughs> and I just said, I just leave it the way it is. And uh, we scratched the, scratched the moss off of an old monument there and looked there and it says, Grandfather was over 100 years old when he died, and grandmother was 103. And then one of my grandparents was 106. I remember him and when he died, Harmon. And uh, they just it run that way in the family. Then my grandfather, on my father's side of the house, married uh, Swafford, and she was the first cousin to Daniel Boone. So we had a little... Uh, <laughs> The old hunting blood in her, you know, like go out and fish and hunt. <laughs> does, does popcorn has to do anything with it? All that popcorn I saw in your kitchen. All that? The popcorn I've seen in your kitchen. Popcorn? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I, I didn't catch what you meant. When we went to your house, you had tons of popcorn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We raised a popcorn that there was a man in our neighborhood there that was a Reverend uh, Thornburg. He bought some uh, popcorn seed about 60 some years ago. And we still have the popcorn, the, the uh, breed of it. It's a little bit of a yellow here about that long. And it just pops better than well, any popcorn I ever saw. And you plant one grain every 26 inches and it'll put up for four to five stalks from that one grain with three to four years on each stalk. And uh, it was Harvey Thornburg, Reverend Harvey Thornburg, that had the corn. And it is amazing how that corn is, <laughs> is just, it's a real popcorn. I understand, though, uh, even so with your very good genes and your healthy outlook, you still do watch, too, what you are eating. What you said? Do you watch what you eat? Well. Pretty careful about it. Yes, I don't eat too much pastry. It's too much sweets, just to, what it takes to balance the food. I grind a lot of my own cornmeal and make my own mush, fry my mush, and, and uh, I fry chicken and eat a lot of chicken, a lot of poultry. I don't eat too much sausage and greasy, uh, greasy stuff. Be careful about eggs, too much cholesterol and too many eggs. About three a week is enough. <laughs> And popcorn. And they eat a lot of popcorn, yeah. <laughs> Good old popcorn. Can you estimate how many kites you've made? I have no idea. Uh, all, I, all I can figure out is I've used 24,000 yards of ripstop dialogue. <laughs> you just have to figure it back from that. That'd be about the way you'd have to run it. But I just never paid attention to the amount, how many I made. I made a snowflake this morning, and then a 
uh, sewed the nine strips together for two more kites and put the sticks in another kite today. And that's all I did. Have uh, any patents on any of the kites you've made? I don't have any patents. They've all been patented to the other fellow. <laughs> okay, and the second question was, uh, who do you think was the creative role model in, in the family? Is it your father or your... Well, my father, he made big kites for us. He put heavy paper on them, you know, we didn't have the right kind of cloth then. And uh, he used heavy paper and large, big, oh, we had big kites. And, uh, we usually made um, a three-stick kite and a two-stick kite, the Eddie kite. And that was William Eddy that uh, designed the Eddy kite. And it has a bow in the back, and that's a very familiar kite to the kids. They, they buy them in the store. Yeah, that's on that style. Has that got the bow? Uh, could have. Could yeah. Have. That looked like a diamond kite. The Eddy kite will fly without a tail. Without a tail? They have a bow in them, you know, and they're just as wide as they are tall. And, it, and one third of the, well, just so far down from the top, you've got to measure so much down there. Yeah, this um, uh, Domino Jalbert, he was the one that designed all the parafoils and parasails and parachutes and things like that. And then there was a man by the name of, um, I'll think of his name in a minute, Paul Garber. He designed kites for the Army and Navy and uh, for the target practice, and for uh, a kite that Mr. Makey, and Mr. And Mrs. Mil Miller, Miller Makey, from over Grove City, Ohio, came over and uh, they bought some kites off of me and they've been here and showed pictures of their slides. They've been to San Francisco and they've been, well, all they're in Taiwan, they were the last I heard, and uh, they, they were real, real enthusiasts about kites. They, they, they know more about kites than I do. They've seen more of them. And he picked up one at a yard sale. I think it was down in Virginia or some one of the southern states. And it happened to be one that uh, Paul Garber had made for him to use to fly two kites up and put a line between them to put the mail on for, to take the mail off by an airplane where they couldn't land up in the Arctic when the Army was up there, when they had the U.S. Army up there. And uh, Mr. Uh, DeBolter could tell you more about that than I can. He's better posted on that. He's been to more kite festivals and been to Detroit, and he just got back from uh, over to Sir, uh, San Diego, and he was at the one at uh, Dublin, and I don't know how many, how many places have you been to the I've been five. five of them, five of the conventions. And they come from all over the world. They come from Japan and Taiwan and, and uh, well, every, about every country brings in the, like kites. The Chinese were the first to start kites about 2,000 years ago, the way the, the books tell it. And, uh, They've been, uh, it spread to Japan, and America was the last uh, country to take up kite flying. But it's gone in the last 10 years, it has spread like wildfire. There's some beautiful kites, some, it's just beyond imagination. Just look here at this one up here. I'm sorry. Could you... Okay. Uh, the question was, uh, what are some of the unusual designs that you had to make? Well, the snowflake is one that's, uh, well, I don't know. There's some that I don't make. I don't even fool with them. They're too complicated. I just wouldn't want to take the time to do all that work that they do on them. And I don't believe I could if I wanted to. <laughs> There's just too much, too much to it. I make the easy kind, the kind that's easy to make. <laughs>
But it's coming to the, uh, now they're getting away from the all styles, but the, the uh, stunt kites. Mr. Uh, uh, DeBolt could tell you how they did out at Sar uh, San Diego. Tell them about the, um, come up and tell them about the, <coughs> the how they flew them in formation, like the uh, Blue Angels. Ansel is right in, in a sense that kite flying has turned the corner and now we're getting into what we call dual line control. What you see here mostly is single line control kites and they depend on the flow of the wind. Okay, now they put two lines to the kite and we fly this kite as if you would drive your automobile. You pull the right line, it goes to the right, and you pull the left line, it goes to the left. If you want it to rise, you hold it still. Now, Peter Powell in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, has originated the dual line control. Is one of the foremost kite, dual line control kites in the country today. The uh, Rainbow Kite Company, which is a dual line control in Cal Venice, California, where his son lives, uh, makes the makes the uh, rainbow kite and it is a fast growing <clears throat> the latest thing out this year is what is called the hawaiian it looks like a carpenter square it's a dual line control but you can turn that kite in right angles whichever way you want it to go i mean it just right now it goes at the convention this year in san diego they had a several teams. One individual flying one kite has got his hands full, but when you get four people standing up here flying four kites that reminds you of the Blue Angels, it just blows your mind to see these individuals flying these kites. For example, you get one kite going this way, another one right behind it, maybe two feet apart, another one right behind that, and so on. They go over here and they do their maneuver here and then they come back here and do the maneuver, and it, they probably end up with a star bust, you know, just like the, the Blue Angels do. It blows your mind to see it, but this is what the, the kite flying is going to be in the future. So I would recommend that anybody buying kite for their grandson, buy them a dual line control, or make your own dual line control, or have Mr. Beck make you a dual line control or Miss Coach make you a dual line control, or David Debolt make you a dual line control, or have Dave come over to give you a demonstration how a dual line control works. It's fascinating. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, would like, I would like to ask the final question, and that is if there is any kind of message that you would like to tell us all here. Well, just keep flying them. <laughs>